Okay. Uh, my name is Dennis Uesugi, and I am the facilitator for this session. The title of this session is The Future of Hawaii's IT Workforce. Uh, for your information, this session will be videotaped. Please turn off or silence your cell phones. If you need to exit during the session, please do so quietly. And no hard questions because we're all going to go. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, introduce our speakers. Our first is uh, Leila Kagawa, Senior IT Program Manager with the Office of Information Management and Technology. Ms. Kagawa oversees the Enterprise Program Management Office, which was established to promote governance, policies, and standards for program and project management, and also extends program support for statewide business transformation initiatives. She previously served as the Deputy Director of the Hawaii Department of Human Resources Development and assisted in the reestablishment of a statewide internship program. Also, she convenes uh, government leaders to the establishment of the State Executive Leadership Forum, which is called SELF, and sponsoring critical system stabilization projects. Uh, the next person we have is Rosie Spraker. Senior Director, Gartner Consulting, SURF Program Director. Uh, Ms. Spraker is currently serving the State of Hawaii as the Program Director for the SURF Program. She has more than 25 years of experience in the private and public sectors in IT and engineering projects, and has worked with the State of Hawaii since 2005. She has managed various programs in large, complex <coughs> environments from for federal, state, local and education organizations. In particular, Ms. Breaker has a strong background in managing enterprise resource planning ERP type uh, programs. Ms. Breaker is a distinguished graduate of Webster University where she earned a master's degree in computer resource and information management. She has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Colorado State uh, <coughs> University and Ms. Breaker holds a PMP certi uh, certification from the Project Management Institute, and has recently been a speaker at the Gartner Program and Portfolio Management uh, Summit in Washington, D.C. Uh, lastly, we have Craig Gravett, Advisory Managing Director for the Colea Project, Project Executive, KPMG. Uh, Craig is an experienced public sector professional with over 20 years of serving the public mission of government. As an appointee for two governors, he has seen government from both the inside and outside, giving him a unique perspective of how to work collaboratively with government agencies in ways that others may not. Uh, both within and outside government, Craig's focus has been on aiding departments and agencies implement and operate IT systems that achieve policy and operational uh, imperatives at high levels of performance. His government experience includes tax, corrections, transportation, human services, and central services such as procurement and HR. He is currently serves as the day-to-day -day project director for the State of Hawaii Department of Human Services, COLEA, Integrated Eligibility Solution Contract. He is published author uh, holds a master's degree and has been teaching at the college level uh, for 18 years uh, with a current curriculum in data analytics. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to our first speaker. Thank you, Dennis. All right, good morning, everyone. Hopefully we um, are going to meet your expectations this morning with uh, today's presentation in terms of future of IT workforce, but uh, what a great uh, opening keynote we had. So I hope you're all inspired and we'll just follow on in terms of uh, the messages that we shared this morning. 
Okay, so today we thought we'd give you the opportunity, at least from the state perspective. Um, as Dennis mentioned, I recently came from the Department of Human Resources, uh, so I was very fortunate to work there, and now I'm kind of making that bridge, if you will, to the uh, Office of Information Management and Technology. And you know, in terms of talking about the workforce, we see this as a great opportunity to talk to you and share with you in terms of what we're doing with regards to system enhancements that are really going to bridge what we do today in terms of our current process and our work uh, flow and really how the systems are going to transform the way we engage with each other in terms of collaboration and innovation as well as um, how we're going to engage with citizens. So you had a little preview in terms of enterprise resource planning this morning. Uh, today we're going to just give you an, a program update, myself and Rosie, in terms of letting you all know where we are. and um, I I like to start all of our sessions with really thanking all of you that are out there that have been involved with the program since the very beginning and we hope to continue to work with you as we uh, move forward in the current plans. Okay, so just to give you background for those of you who are not familiar with the term, you know, about a year ago we had a contest to kind of name what ERP is all about and what it means to the state of Hawaii. So the program is now referred to as SURF, which Keone mentioned this morning. And it's really to transform government state operations um, in all the seven functional areas. And for those of you that have been through this process in and of itself, you know, we did a real collaborational effort, you know, sponsored by the Department of Budget and Finance, partnering with OMT to really take a survey from our entire workforce in terms of what we need to move forward. So it really needs all of your cocoa and help to really be able to look at what we do today and looking at all the different systems that are out there so that we can share information and make it more valuable. So I just wanted to give you a background in terms of what the SURF initiative is all about and how it's going to give us opportunities in terms of how we see the workforce going forward. Okay. So this slide is probably familiar to you for those of you that have been work with us through this journey thus far. But SURF is really going to um, approach the statewide systems in the seven areas and functions um, from the onset in terms of how we onboard folks and bring them into the state in terms of human resource management, you know, how we account for their time and what they do here in terms of their work that they do with time and attendance and, and payroll, and then of course, continuing in terms of the cycle with, you know, how we manage financial systems, budget, how we acquire new systems, uh, processes, those kinds of things, and, and of course, grants management. So really, the SURF initiative is all-encompassing in terms of the scope, and but we really want to get a big picture view and look in terms of the future in terms of what this system, uh, statewide system, can do in terms of transform the way we work. Okay. So just to give you some background in terms of the seven functions. Okay, so how does this help us in terms of, you know, uh, addressing current challenges. So this is all familiar to a lot of you in terms of where we are, you know, from any area of the operation. The way I see it, you know, I spent a lot of my time before I came to this state in private sector and used to work with a lot of different businesses. Um, but the way I see it is really using systems to bridge what we do and give employees tools and support to get what they need done. So we've said from the very beginning of the ER program, ERP program, um, when I first served on the steering committee, uh, when I first came to this state, it's really about bridging what we do, and it's not uh, designed to replace what replace human capital because we still need that. It's very important, but th these are just examples of some of the functions that we often have to deal with in terms of manual functions. Okay, so as you know, um, state payroll is very important. DAGS processes payroll for um, quite a bit of employees, and um, you know, there's a lot of manual ca calculations still today to get the paychecks done, but I really want to applaud uh, DAGS and the personnel in terms of what they do every day to support us there. Um, you've heard different speakers in prior years talk about budget and finance data and really being able to have that information available to decision makers, to all of you as leaders in the organization, and as we onboard the new administration, really to be able to give them a snapshot of what we're doing on a financial level. So it's going to impact those areas in terms of some of the current challenges we have with respect to systems. Um, of course, on the left there, you know, talking about the volume of purchase orders that are processed and what we have to do to get that through with the, uh, in terms of uh, procurement and those kinds of uh, activities. 
Okay, so if all of you in the room have probably seen, touched, or approved the peak form in your lifetime at the state. So that's something that is near and dear to all of us as in terms of process. So that's something that is going to be enhanced and improved with the SURF program. Okay, and just a little statistics in terms of, you know, all the process process that ends up at DAGS, you know, there's quite a, a bit of paper that is a result of what we do today. So we want to be able to move forward, get what we need to get done in terms of approvals and acknowledgement, and hopefully go green while we're, while we're doing so. Okay, and then payroll adjustments. So this is just a snapshot, a really small snapshot of what we're doing today in terms of system impact and uh, what we're trying to do and assess with the SURF program. Okay. So we see this as an opportunity in terms of how it will impact us. You know, we, we looked at this program and we think that it's going to really take a lot more talent, human capital, expertise that's all in this room, but we're also looking to our partners here to really share with us, you know, some of the best practices that other government entities and agencies were able to realize. So these are some of the things that we feel will be beneficial to us as a workforce. You know, it's huge in terms of looking at new systems, but really being able to capitalize on knowledge transfer and um, training in terms of modern technologies and tools. And a lot of what we're doing in the program office is really to get an assessment about where we are and do different interim projects and do some training on that. And, as, and we're learning as a state and as a group, so there's gonna be opportunities for us as a whole at all different levels to learn uh, other skills. Um, you know, there will also be roles and maybe jobs and functions that may not exist today. And if you've been involved with the transformation, uh, OMT has really been um, at the forefront in terms of sponsoring new skills and, and methodologies, whether it's project management, um, things around cybersecurity, as we talked about the Security Operations Center this morning, um, the portal that we all are very proud of with the state, and then really capitalizing on business intelligence, you know, how we use information and what data we use and is available to us to make decisions. Okay, and how nice would it be for our IT operations folks in the room at the departments and centrally if there were fewer systems to manage? You know, we um, talk about the systems that are in the data center today that may uh, exist beyond some of our years here at the state, but really just trying to consolidate that so that we can uh, leverage efficiencies. And of course, with any initiative around um, transformation and business process improvement, really having the integrated system and everything automated with um, proper advisement from, from folks like yourself, okay? And then looking at you know, talent management, workforce management, and succession planning. And for me, this is something, again, near and dear to my heart. I think coming into the state and seeing a lot of very dedicated, committed employees servicing the public, you know, it's really t trying to figure out how to capitalize all of that expertise and knowledge. And as we bring in new folks to the state, as, we, as folks decide that they want to retire, it's really how to use the, the system to capture a lot of that knowledge, not 100%, of course, but use that to really support us going forward to onboard new uh, employees to the state as folks, uh, uh, as we you know, experience attrition and other things, okay? And being you know, agile, agile to make different changing business requirements. I always talk about you know, this time of year is nice and it's the end of the year, but it's very busy for our fiscal folks and our man, uh, budget folks as they're preparing for the legislative season. And every department feels this pain in terms of trying to get reports and uh, information to the legislature among others, okay? And then of course we talked about innovation, collaboration among state workers across the state. This really gives us a better position to be able to respond to inquiries, be able to respond to citizen, citizen inquiries and, and service them, okay? And then of course governance and decision making becomes a lot more um, focused and strategic and prioritized, okay? So I'm just gonna give you a snapshot of what we're doing in terms of where we are with the program. And um, as you can see, this, this diagram just gives you an idea of where we are um, in terms of the ERP program, the SURF program. So of course, it does encapsulate all the seven functions as I mentioned to you before. Um, but it's you know, a long journey. 
uh, in terms of getting to that to be state and that integrated system. So there's been a lot of work out in the departments to really stabilize a lot of the systems that are out there that might be legacy, that might have different maintenance schedules that are beyond support. So you'll see a lot of activity here um, there at the left, um, from everything from you know asset management, something that was just launched uh, last month to begin to track that information, thanks to the help of our folks at DAGS and Public Works. Uh, we have an Intergram Grants Project to really be able to track federal grants properly and make sure that we can have that data to uh, bid on grants going forward. And then other reporting um, systems like budget and variance and um, variance reporting, and that's something that's going to be key for different departments. Um, there are other systems that are in place that, for those of you with um, are familiar with the HRMS system with the executive branch, the HRMS system has been very well supported over the past uh, 10, 15 years. But again, the system, the infrastructure, and the the software was something that needed to be updated. So we're in a project right now to update that system so that we're, re we're ready to transition to ERP. So you'll see that coming down in terms of impact to your departments. And they were also working on payroll and finance. So, you know, uh, interim activities around payroll automation, really bridging some data with DOE and making sure that that can be something that we can improve and time and leave reporting. So there's a lot of interim projects that we're launching as we speak. So we just wanted to update you in terms of what we're doing and uh, thank you for your engagement in terms of all the fact finding and the process that we're going through. And for those of you, I see some financial folks in the room. What's also important is having um, a uniform chart of accounts. So really something that will um, connect to everything we do and making sure that payroll is easy at the end of the process. Okay, And then, of course, the ERP initiative is not just about the software and systems and the workflows, but it's really making sure that we implement the infrastructure that is necessary to, to stand up and support a statewide ERP. So there's been a lot of work that's been done in that area. Okay. So this is basically a blowout of what I've just spoken of in terms of the projects, but you can see kind of where we are in terms of timelines. So uh, as you know, the state is going through a uh, procurement in terms of looking at what systems are out there that could help us in the long, ru long run, and uh, really um, looking at how to phase that implementation in terms of buckets. So it's really you know, trying to look at opportunities to do HR payroll, time and attendance kind of all together, because that makes sense in terms of how the functions are integrated, and then right behind it is financial acquisition and then budget preparation. So there, there's a lot of effort that's been going down um, for you know since uh, we launched the RFP last year. Okay, so as you can see, in terms of the chart reference, there's a lot of uh, go live dates, and we're in different phases of the in our own projects. Uh, so so that's something that we wanted to uh, present to you today. Okay, all right and then the infrastructure, okay? I'm gonna ask Rosie to speak about kind of where we're heading and um, in terms of other practices that, in terms of what governments are doing. So I'll turn it over to Rosie. Thank you, Layla, and thank you, Dennis, for the introduction. And thank, thank you to all of you. And uh, like Layla said, we are seeing many familiar faces. Many people have been involved with the, the SURF program so far. Uh, we've been uh, supporting the state in this effort for a little over two years now with the original development of the feasibility study report to then uh, get the momentum going, development of the request for proposal that has been uh, released back in, in 2013. And then we received offers in, in around April of, of 2014. And along the way, we've been evaluating the proposals that have come in. Now, of course, we have to keep that confidential because uh, to, to keep, maintain the security of the procurement process. But we can tell you that we are still moving uh, full steam ahead and we are making progress in the long term to move to the eventual serve solution that will meet the needs of the state. But in the meantime, we're working on these interim projects and we're happy to help the state move forward and getting ready for SURF. So anything that we can do now to get, get us prepared toward the longer term effort is always a positive thing. So what are the, the goals of the program and how does that affect you as IT workers? Uh, we, we wanted to share this information with you so that you understand uh, that this is really an opportunity for you as IT workers to also help move the state forward.
forward in its IT efforts. So it's, it's kind of twofold. You can help with the program from the infrastructure, uh, setting up the infrastructure, setting up the, the system, and working with the project, and then eventually helping to maintain the system going forward. But it's also your recipient of the, the benefits of this program as well, as state employees, as state workers, because part of it is human resource payroll. You're going to have access to your own employee information online. You will have uh, access to the open, transparent government. You're going to have access to the budget information, uh, budget variance reports, and a dashboard will be presented and you know, open access to not only you as IT workers, but also to the state's constituents. So many stakeholders will uh, receive the benefit of this new system. So it's going to create new opportunities for you as, as uh, you know, new roles and responsibilities to help maintain and support these systems. You'll have the uh, capability to be working on you know, the latest technologies. So, uh, and, and also, just as we grow our IT workforce in the state of Hawaii, the new, new people coming out of University of Hawaii, they're going to have opportunities here to be working on the latest and greatest technologies. So some of the goals of, of the, the project um, are listed here in terms of being able to have open, transparent government, to have uh, data, that your personal data, as well as all the financial data, you know, the security that we heard in the session this morning. What are we doing this to, to protect the state's data? Well, certainly those kinds of requirements will be built into, into this uh, SERF program. They're built into the requirements, and you know, we, we talk about them on a day-to-day -day basis as we move through the program. Uh, so it, uh, Layla talked a little bit about the agility too, and of course we're going to be able to, to accommodate the, the changing needs of the state. So certainly uh, things are moving quicker and, and faster at, in the state as, as it is nationwide in terms of IT requirements. So we need a system that can we can actually grow with, and, it, and it, we want to make sure that we build into the contracts that we're going to have a, a maintenance and operations. So upgrades will be part of the contract, ongoing maintenance will be part of the contract, so whenever we select a, a solution and a system vendor to come in and help us, that they're not just going to you know, go away when the system's Im implemented, and then we're st you know, stuck on that version. So uh, a lot of our current systems, we we're actually stuck on old versions, and it's uh, you know, difficult to maintain and, and keep those older versions up and running. We're going to keep this system up and refreshed all along the way. So those are just some of the goals that we have as far as the SURF program. And this is one example, you know, the flagship program of the state of Hawaii at this time. You know, certainly there are other programs that are, are moving forward in the state, but we thought this would be a good example to show that as we move to new technologies, that you as IT workers will be able to take advantage of that by uh, working on the latest and greatest technologies, but also be recipients in terms of benefits for, uh, in terms of uh, a human resource and payroll system that will help manage your information personally having access to your own information through employee self-service. So uh, moving on here, this, uh, the picture actually uh, depicts the number of systems that in a survey uh, conducted a couple years ago, we had like 743 systems out in all of the departments. And so each of the dots there represents systems out in the departments. But of those, of those the, the green dots there represent all the systems that may be potentially replaced by the SURF program. There are actually 120 different systems performing the functions of the current uh, functionality that we want to replace. And so each of those have the potential of being replaced or at a minimum being interfaced to and integrated with the SURF program. Then you can see that you know, they're, they're all over the departments and uh, certainly there will be a benefit in, in just minimizing the number of systems to a single integrated solution. So that uh, again, as, as Layla mentioned, have a single integrated solution will be easier to maintain, be lower risk for the state and also be on the latest technologies. Now, I also wanted to present a couple of examples of how other government organizations have moved through this process and some of the um, benefits, again, that they've been able to achieve as well. So first of all, we talked about a little bit about the state of Wisconsin project, and it's very similar in size, scope, and complexity to the state of Hawaii project. They have the uh, same functional areas that are being replaced and some of the benefits that they've been able to, to realize. Uh, again, uh, it's going to be easier to retain IT staff because you are going to be working on the latest technologies and it's, it's so that it, it, there's an interest level that uh, we'll be able to provide to you to be able to maintain those technologies. So just like at State of, of 
uh, Wisconsin. Uh, and also, uh, you know, eliminating uh, redundant data. To, currently, we have all these 120 systems, and oftentimes you're having to enter data in one system and then enter the same data in another system. Or we're having to mark up green bar paper for payroll, and we're shipping boxes over to, uh, you know, ICSD to be able to implement and, and get payroll out. Well, all of those things can be um, uh, streamlined, as well as having a single source, source of truth, a single source for the data that can be trusted. And we have data and error correction uh, on, on, as data enter, is entered, so that you're actually going to have good, clean, reliable data, which is also very important. Uh, another example is the Tennessee Valley Authority. It's a federal organization in electric utility, and they just went through this process and they implemented a human resource uh, and payroll system as well as a learning management system. So uh, learning management is, is one more area that will be part of the system. So not only will you be maintaining a, a high-tech system, it'll actually have learning, online learning for various courses, whatever they may be, and tracking certifications and, and tracking the completion of courses, even things like cyber security, if you have a policy that everyone has to take a cybersecurity course to be refreshed each year, a learning management system can help with that uh, tracking and recording. And so, uh, the, again, mentioning the uh, employee self-service access, they have access from uh, anywhere 24-7 from their, their cell phones, from their iPads, to their own personal information, whether they want to go look at their W-2s, whether they want to look at their pay stub at the, end of the, at the end of each pay period, or just go look at their, you know, go update their address information. They have that capability online. And managers have uh, greater empowerment because now they can actually execute transactions where previously they'd have to go ask their HR rep to go, you know, I would like to, you know, promote this employee for a good performance and I've been able to manage their performance and been on paper. Well, let's get it into the system. So now they can actually go take care of those, initiate those promotion actions online through the manager self-service and it goes through a workflow. So it goes to their, their HR uh, representative for review and approval through electronically. They don't have to actually, you know, walk the paper to the desk to the desk and get signatures. Those kinds of things. And so it enables users to be more independent as well. So they're not always having to come to you to ask them to develop a report. They can actually go in and, and do little queries on their own and have tools and, and have business intelligence so that they can create their own report reports so that actually alleviates you to be able to work on higher value tasks. You can be working on you know, the next upgrade or, or other things that can be providing value to the state. So these are some examples from other organizations that ERP really is possible. ERP can be so successful. Uh, we just went uh, live with Tennessee Valley Authority, which I personally was able to help them through that uh, December 26, 2013. So they've been running live for almost a year now, and they're already realizing the benefits of their system. So thank you so much, and I'll turn it back to Layla. Thanks, Rosie. Yeah, so in the short time we have with you today, you know, we just wanted to give you a preview of what's being done and update with the SURF initiative, but we see this as a huge opportunity in terms of really, again, connecting and bridging the workforce opportunity here. So using systems to get a lot of the functions done over time so that we can, like Rosie just mentioned, really transform the organization into, in terms of using your skill, talent, and experience for higher valued work, and then really being able to be able to connect with one another through the system. So, you know, this is also an open invitation for those of you who are interested in helping with this effort. Um, you can definitely reach out to us and the program team will be uh, sending out a lot of more communications to engage your feedback and help as we go through the process. Um, but I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank everyone in the room. Um, also acknowledge uh, our SURF team members, Beverly Diaz, Arthur Minagawa, Renee Nagahisa, and Eric Nouchi that they're in the room. And if they reach out to you, please be friendly to them <laughs> and our program team here as uh, we continue this journey with all of you. So with that, we'll be here. We'll turn it over to our co-presenter uh, from KPNG, but we'll be here through the entire session to answer any questions that you have on the presentation. Okay, thank you. Good here? 
Great. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. I'm going to take a slightly different tact at this, uh, but I think there's some common themes. I think we heard, uh, you know, a bit about a journey, you know, a bit about agility, a bit about, uh, you know, leading edge technology and staff retention and other uh, uh, very important concepts as uh, technology continues to transform a digital government. Right? Uh, what I'm going to talk about here, and I've just got uh, five quick slides. Um, is a, a snippet out of a three-day session that we've done with uh, many state executives across the Western United States, all the way from state CIOs and program directors on the business side through departmental CIOs, uh, supervisorial staff, and line staff, and talking about how uh, you know, a digital government is transforming their operations and the, and the, and the challenges and the promise that they're, uh, they're trying to uh, seek you know, to balance. And uh, so hopefully some of this, uh, you know, you will feel uh, applies uh, to Hawaii. I, 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 won't, I won't tell you who, but there have been people from Hawaii who have participated in this. Um, you know, this is, uh, but I think you, you'll find that these are themes that are common within government, right? We're all struggling uh, with, uh, you know, very, very similar things, different degrees and that sort of thing uh, in different jurisdictions. But these are, these are very common um, and, you know, the, the biggest one is really just the balance in workforce development, really trying to seek, you know, a, a equilibrium where the benefits are outweighing the cost and the complexity, right? You know, we all, we all sort of talk about the merits of a enriched and developed workforce, right? You know, it, it helps us become more self-sufficient as a government entity. It helps us deliver faster projects or lower risk projects, right? It helps us, you know, really increase our, our staff satisfaction through training and development, right? Helping them build careers, not just jobs, right? You know, all of these things, right? And we hope that that results ultimately in um, you know a more attractive place for people to start and grow and and ultimately you know continue all the way through to closure of their careers, uh, you know government as a as a destination right, but it's not without its complexities right you know there's costs associated with staff development you know that adds a that adds a an element to this uh, many governments complain that they say you know we have too many solutions. We don't know what to train people on, right? Because of either, you know, they complain about procurement or they complain about lack of standards. And they say, you know, we got, we're like, uh, you know, Comdex, we got one of everything, right? You know, so what do, what, what do I actually train my staff on, right? Uh, you know, they, they are express concern over being at varying phases of the life cycle. They say, hey, well, some departments have just bought new shiny objects and they're all excited about the latest and greatest. And other ones are dealing with, you know, 27 or 30 or 35 year old, you know, mainframe systems. How do we develop a workforce that's dealing across a full spectrum of life cycles, right? We have budget instability, right? So even if you can swallow, you know, the cost, you know, the idea is, well, what can we commit to next year's budget? Do we know that that's going to be two years out, that I can keep this pace of staff development? Because if I don't, if I set an expectation that I'm able to make an investment in my staff, you know, can I really commit to that? Or two years from now, when the budget's not there for it and there's, and there's no training, you know, do I then have an even more dissatisfied workforce, you know, as a result of it? You know, and then there's always, you know, uh, you know, opportunism of staff, and that that's both on the private sector and the public sector, right? You go and train up some of your staff. If they don't feel like there's going to be economic, you know, opportunity for additional training in the future, they might say, hey, I better take this opportunity to go do something else now that I got this new training, right? So if they don't really feel that there is opportunity in government long term, and that government is really the place where they can grow and build and nurture their career the most, you know, they might be a one and done after you go and invest a lot of money in a training program for them. Likewise, you have, you know, folks from the private sector that would be happy to hire them, right? You know, and then, you know, we all know there's a disparity in public sector and private sector salaries. The public sector has never been able to keep up with private sector salaries. So you've got, you know, a, a natural disharmony that exists there. Right. So, you know, on the one side, you know, we're really hoping that all these benefits outweigh, uh, you know, all of these complexities. But these complexities are not trivial. Right. They, they really aren't. And, you know, many governments are struggling with, you know, how to how to rationalize and build an, an equilibrium where they can, uh, you know, make sure that their their goals are exceeding 
uh, you know, from a value perspective, uh, the uh, consequences of these complexities. So this is a model we built with the, uh, with the team at the three-day colloquium. We're really going into a deep dive, and there was about you know, 600 different you know, elements that came out of this, but this was really kind of the synthesis, right? As you grow your IT portfolio, you need to grow your staff development investment, and you've got to keep those kind of in lockstep, right? If you look at the blue boxes, those are kind of the healthy balances. Right? If you're very early in the life cycle and you say, hey, we have not invested a lot in our IT portfolio, at least not recently, perhaps, you know, the prevailing thought is you, you will have a competent staff right, that are very familiar with your existing systems and probably through institutional knowledge and on-the-job training over the last you know, you know, 5, 10, 15, 30 years, you know, they've become proficient with those systems. Right? And so you know, you're very credible at running the as-is. Right? And once you step away from that and you say, okay, we want to do something more. We either, if we invest in our portfolio, but we don't invest in our staff, then we have some disharmony that gets created because now we have vendors showing up to implement new systems, but our staff don't understand those new systems. They don't, you know, and they can't really productively engage, right? And that's bad for both, right? It's certainly bad for government. It's also bad for the vendor. Right? I mean, the, the dirty little secret is everybody kind of needs to do this together, right? And we have to be able to do it sort of lockstep together because as soon as we achieve, you know, a, a instability between those two, neither one of us are going to be successful, right? You know, the private sector needs government to, to be able to enrich its workforce to move along that continuum as well, right? It's not, you know, there's an old saying in the consulting industry, you know, heaven help us if our clients learn how to do this work themselves, right? <laughs> The, uh, that's actually not true. We really, really need clients um, to be able to move along that continuum, right? There are vital roles that government has to be able to play in IT transformation in order for it to be successful, right? So you, you don't want to get into a spot where your, your staff are falling behind uh, their ability to engage with the vendor community. Likewise, if we start to do a, a major staff development effort, but we don't really have the IT portfolio to justify that, you have a bunch of staff that now suddenly find themselves with new skills, but no opportunity to exercise those skills, right? And so then they're like, well, hey, and IT is one of the rare talent bases within government that they share with the private sector, right? You know, there are many, many roles in government where it's so specialized the knowledge that it's not necessarily that easily transferable. But if you're a network engineer or a system DBA or something like that, you know, guarantee those skills are transferable to you know, a uh, commercial entity down the street, right? So as you work up, you want to make sure that your workforce is, 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 is skilled in the relevant tools and can match you know, their roles so that the transformation can happen in a very healthy way, right? And that's, that equilibrium is easy to put on a slide, not necessarily easy to achieve, but I think that uh, you're in very good company as you start to consider the implications of when you, you know, put RFPs together, when you consider new projects, you know, feel very empowered and very uh, strongly committed to the idea that if the state's going to do something, that the workforce has got to be prepared to, to, to be lockstep uh, with that initiative. And I think that's the journey that uh, Rosie and Layla were, were describing. You know, um, one of the other things that came out of this was, you know, being intensely knowledgeable and, and really uh, sort of in a brass tax way about your own IT portfolio, right? It is very uh, easy to get wrapped up, and many states, you know, express their own concern about this. They get wrapped up in this IT vision, right? But it never really tracks to reality. Right? And so ultimately, you really have to understand what your true portfolio is, what are you actually going to be acting on in the next three to five years, because that's where the staff expectations are going to be from a training perspective. Right? If you know, you're thinking about a 10 or 15 or 20 year vision, right? you know, the, the, the linkage between your actions from a staff development perspective today are fairly indirect to that. But if you're looking at three to five years and you're really putting your, you know, 
uh, your heads together about what that IT portfolio really is. You know, are we, are we in fact comfortable doing things like standardizing, right? If we have a single product platform in one area, yeah, is that better for the state? And if it is, do we have a workforce development plan that actually helps people get trained on that? There are gonna be times where you say, from an IT portfolio perspective, we want to keep you know, heterogeneity, right? It's in the state's best interest for, and for our IT portfolio to keep that. And maybe we will not be able to bridge the gap to uh, our staff development plans, right? And you do that knowingly, but don't do it by default, right? Make it a conscious effort. Um, one of the, uh, the things that comes out of this, right, is the idea that uh, IT tasks in particular, although this really translates beyond IT, get really categorized into about three broad categories. Things you do every day, right, the routine, keeping the lights on, helping to make sure the operation is healthy and running, right? And that, you know, uh, the consensus was it should be a basis of high investment, right? That is an area where government should you know, predictably be able to invest and get a return on that investment to say, hey, if I need uh, admins or I need other uh, skill sets that are routine in nature, I should be very, very comfortable investing in those. Then you're gonna run into transformational resources that are used less frequently, but might be used consistently across a portfolio of uh, IT, right? So in the case of, uh, you know, you might have uh, limited development staff, configuration staff, people that build new things, right? Any particular department not, might not be constantly doing that, but if you were to look across a group of departments or a group of divisions in a large department, you may see, you know, that it's, it, you have a stable, you know, uh, body of uh, configuration work or development work that would warrant uh, some level of investment, right? And then you have those things that are truly generational where it's once in a career. You know, we have many, many clients and we see many states that say, hey, you know, our, our staff have been using this system for 25 years. I do not need to train them on the transformational skills to migrate to a new system because we only do it every 25 years, right? That you don't need to build a bunch of staff that are competent in that kind of transformation, right? And that's something that uh, you know, many states wrestle with in terms of actually you know, breaking down their investment and saying, hey, we, you know, you know, taking a look at uh, you know, a pyramid, your base is going to be you know, the things that you do every day, every night, you know, to keep government running effectively, right? And then uh, you know, measured investments as you look uh, you know, down, the, uh, down the categories. And uh, the thing that I will uh, close with here is just a, uh, a set of the, the lessons learned that came out of this. And again, this is all very distilled down, but I think these are very, they're very powerful and I, I think they'll resonate with everybody in the room, right? You know, certainly balancing your IT strategy with a workforce development strategy you know, it's, it's one thing to talk about, you know, all of the, you know, the, you know, the new shiny objects and, you know, the vision and all of that. But if you don't have a workforce that is in lockstep with you, none of it's going to happen, right? And, we, and, and this is self-attested from, you know, other states, other, you know, uh, departmental CIOs. You know, this is where their scars can be, you know, your advantage. Right, because they, you know, they have made these mistakes, and they say, you know, if I could have done this over again, I would have f focused more on my workforce and what was feasible for my workforce to do, and align my IT strategy more interdependently with it. A lot of them say the state CIO or you know whoever has put forward a vision, and now we're going to make our workforce <laughs> development plan match to it. It's much more interdependent than that. You know, just because you know somebody said make it so doesn't mean it's going to be so, right? Um, you know, and really know yourself. If you're not able to define standards, if you're, you know, wanting to have more diversity through your procurement process, make sure that you're contemplating that as part of your staff development. It's not a failure of decision making, right? You can make these decisions willfully and say, hey, we want to be more standardized or we want to be more federated, right? Both, I mean, it's taste great or less filling, right? <coughs> they're, they're not bad decisions. The bad decision is what follows. Right? by not aligning the subsequent uh, work and plans to coordinate with those decisions, right? Obviously, setting realistic goals, always good. 
you know, uh, trying to put out the unobtainable, you know, uh, achievement, you know, that, uh, you know, a government entity is going to be entirely self-sufficient or, you know, be able to, you know, implement, you know, these once in a career kind of transformations, uh, you know, itself, you know, successfully, you know, on schedule, you know, you know, uh, you know, probably probably too much to to commit to. But in terms of identifying strategic areas, where uh, departments, agencies, and uh, you know, even maybe even the state as a whole, you know, wants to uh, develop competency. You know, we see this in areas like uh, uh, reporting. You know, developing reporting an uh, analysts within the state. You know, for the various reporting tools, very very powerful. Lots of uh, mileage being received uh, by state entities in those areas because they're linked very clearly with their business needs. Um, you know, so you know there there are lots of areas that are that are potentials. Um, certainly, avoiding the extremes. You know, the one of the things that we've learned is that stability uh, and continuity, uh, predictability, is um, uh, a very important comfort for the IT workforces uh, in digital government uh, environments. You know, trying to you know do these whipsaws where you know it's feast and famine and so forth uh, makes the workforce very skittish. It makes them not trust management, and it makes them want to do something else for somebody else, right? So trying to find where's that harmony that you can reach and the stability that you can commit to, so that you can have you know you know legitimate conversations with your workforce about that investment that you're making to help them grow and and be stronger as a team, um, you know, is uh, is very valuable. And then the last thing is, you know, be, be comfortable experimenting. Even if you said, you know, we are totally committed to taking over, uh, you, know, uh, you know, reporting and analytics ourselves. We want to become data warehouse experts. That doesn't mean that day one you have to do it all yourself, right? You know, what it means is if you're going to have somebody come in and help you, make sure a significant part of that effort includes the knowledge transfer that Layla talked about earlier and you know that you're really driving that to an outcome where you know it's like we watch them then we do it together then they watch us then we do it ourselves right you know that kind of evolution right so that you can uh, you can get ultimately to where you want to go right and uh, you know, like I said, these these were excerpts that came out of a, a three-day session with um, you know IT uh, leaders and colleagues at all levels across uh, Western 13 states. Uh, hopefully, some of that resonated with you. Hopefully, some of it actually gives you the uh, the wind in your sails to help continue to drive the great initiatives that you're doing. And uh, with that, I will uh, yield the floor. And I think we're gonna maybe do a little bit of uh, easy questions. I heard only easy questions, right? <laughs> so. Thank you, all of you. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Um, first of all, can you have a copy of the slides later? Because some of them have a lot of text on them. We couldn't see all the text. And my question is, um, there are demographic changes in most of Hawaii, and also especially in government in Hawaii. I'm curious to your thoughts on that, and how do you guys IT workers in government, and also the serve programs? So I can um, uh, respond to your question. So uh, we'll make the slides available. There is a ERP website that I did not show you, but it's erp.hawaii.gov. So we'll make the information and the presentation available for, for you to access. And your second question, in terms of demographics, you know, I think there's opportunities, and I've looked at this in terms of my lens from the HR point of view. Uh, it's really an opportunity for us to look at 
you know, kind of talking about what Craig spoke of, you know, what is that development plan in terms of where do we want to be? And I think it's going to open up opportunities to at least, in my view, work with the folks that are in the colleges in our state and really reaching out to them. Uh, part of one of the things that we've been doing over the last two years with OMT when I was at DHERD is we were trying to reach out to do uh, internship collaboration opportunities. So that's something that I think we have to start at home first and really engage the, the incoming workforce to, to show them what opportunities there are here within government. And I think that we've been um, fairly successful in terms of giving that opportunity to folks here. And hopefully over time, uh, more opportunities will surface in terms of you know, how that will change. And then outside of that, you know, in terms of the expertise that we may not have collectively yet, it's looking to our partners to really bring in that talent and expertise. And again, you know, now that we have this blend of the incoming workforce and existing talent is really trying to do that knowledge transfer. So that's what I see it today, uh, but that again will change over time. Thankfully, the state of Hawaii has been very lucky that folks that are eligible to retire don't. And they've, they're they very committed and they've helped us shepherd through and, and you know give us good advice and advice going forward in this transformation. So th that's just my uh, thoughts on your question. Do you folks have anything you want to add? That's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your question. Anyone else have any questions? Yes. Yeah, so I'll take a stab at that. No, just from the state perspective, um, I think the the oh yes, yes. What the question was in terms of not just the incoming workforce, but what are the efforts around the existing workforce in terms of providing support? Yes, um, there's a huge opportunity here as well. And uh, I think it's really looking at opportunities and prioritizing in terms of training and development. Um, some of the things that I noticed coming to this state is, you know, when, of course, like any organization, when there's tight resources, then training opportunities diminish and there's less focus on that. So really trying to focus on that opportunity. And a lot of that work has been done by OMT. Um, to really start with, you know, things like how do we manage projects? How do we make sure that we're, we've got methodologies in place so that we as a state can really demand what we need in terms of deliverables? So giving you those tools. Uh, on the flip side of the house, looking at opportunities to train on our existing systems, you know. So we have a project going on with HRMS with that particular upgrade. And what we're doing is utilizing this opportunity to get us to a interim step in terms of of ERP, but use that up as an opportunity to build out a bit of bigger training group and really reaching out to our subject matter experts to have them carry forward the opportunity to use a new system. So we are definitely putting resources to that end to make sure that our existing workforce is able to get that skills augmentation in terms of new systems and then really just build on what they've already know. Yeah. Thank you. Can I add? Just a little bit to add to that. As we bring on new systems and we create an RFP that actually um, goes out and, and selects a vendor, we have a certain budget for that whole program. And, and as Layla mentioned, sometimes your budget starts to dwindle. Training is some of the is one of those things that you start to you know decrease. As opposed to that pr approach, we're actually building it into the, the vendor's contract right up front. We're requiring them to provide an enhanced training program for the state to actually learn how to use the system. And it's part of the transformation. So it's not just how to use the system, but it's going to be training on the new business process and the transformational effort that will go along with it. As well as on the IT side, there will be IT training already built in to the contract. So it's not something that we can just say, OK, well, let's just eliminate training now that we don't have enough money. It's actually part of this firm fixed price contract. So you look at that up front, and there's all this kind of uh, knowledge transfer going along during the course of the project, so that once the project goes live, you're already ready and, and able to support the system. And as uh, was mentioned before, first you you know the vendor supports the system, and while you watch, then the vendor uh, you know provides that knowledge transfer to you. Then you actually support the system while they watch, and then you're able to stand on your own. So that whole knowledge transfer is even built into the ongoing maintenance and operations phase. So it's optional for us to use the vendor's uh, 
skill sets and, and subject matter experts, but once we're able to stand on our own on the state side, then we can uh, no longer need the services of the vendor. So all that's built in up front, and it was all you know well planned ahead of time, so that the budget will be allocated for that, so that you know you can't eat into your training budget just because you're getting low on funds. Yes, the gentleman in front here, and we have one more. Okay, so the question is, as far as the digital, digital transformation, there's a lot of benefit to us as a workforce, but how does it benefit our taxpayers and citizens? Um, my perspective on that is that, you know, in terms of how we deliver services and respond to the taxpayers, we're able to respond to inquiries, uh, processes, you know, um, the, the term that was often used when the state went through the initial phase of this plan is, you know, we want to be online versus in line. So really, I think it's being able to deliver the services that the state citizens require of government in, in, a, in a way that we can get to information quicker. Right, so that's kind of my perspective in terms of how I see this transformation really benefiting the taxpayer. And of course, the transaction cost today is so high because, you know, in my you know in my experiences, like when we have to get information, it may go through, you know, a manager to a division chief to you know the whole the whole team in terms of how we get to that response. The transaction time alone, it might be something that is worth looking at in terms of how we're efficiently able to get the information. So I think it's just if we're more efficient and we can get to information sooner, then the taxpayer benefits by that whole effort in terms of uh, the process. Yeah. Thank you for that question. We had one more gentleman. We have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, yeah, you talked about transitioning kind of sort of knowledge space. Uh, I see a question of problem when I retire, my staff, my extension can't hire it. They said we can have sort of knowledge over the person. Until I actually physically yeah. leave. Yeah. After physically leaving, that knowledge space is honored. Yeah. So you guys talk about, oh, I want to put investment, high investment for making mistakes. You're going to lose it when I retire. I'm not coming back. <laughs> I know, and, and you know, I've seen that happen many times, and so I definitely understand that concern, because that was my, one of the first struggles that we had looking at from the HR and staffing level. I can't begin to bring on that new person, if I'm a division chief or a department head, until that physical person is not in that position anymore. So that's something that, you know, we should look at as a group to see if there is another approach to that to get make that happen. But today, there are other opportunities that are within our, our realm in terms of, you know, we have people that are temporarily assigned to positions that maybe they you can look at a vacant position in your operation that they can be temporarily assigned um, and, you know, giving the additional duties in terms of the team and having that knowledge transfer take place. We do have folks that are detailed to different responsibilities again, and that's within the framework of what's allowable today. And that's how we're actually handling this SURF program. You know, we have people that may not be in that function detailed to the program. Um, so those are current opportunities, but I do share your concern that you know, it's not like we can onboard someone at the same time and then begin to train them. But I, I think we look to you for uh, some guidance and some opportunities to build that out. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? All right. With that, we thank you very much for joining us today and have a great summit.